by uh, Jörg Hoffmann. Uh, he's a research fellow in, in Max Planck Institute uh, in Munich. Uh, he has been extensively working on uh, data regulation, uh, competition law. And if I'm not mistaken, you were also working on uh, uh, payment system, financial uh, technology regulation, right? Yes, exactly. And um, today he's going to talk about DMA. Uh, and uh, thank you for um, coming here. and. Thank you for being with us here uh, online. Uh, you have 40 minutes and after, after your presentation, we have like 15, 20 minutes of Q&A session. Uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jörg. Yeah, thank you very much, Jem. Um, and also thank you very much for the invitation here. Uh, it's a shame that we couldn't actually change because I'm now delving much more into a general overview of the DMA firstly, to give you a proper understanding what the DMA is really all about. Um, and I think Herman was just really looking already into much more detail with some interoperability obligations, but I think it doesn't matter. It also can, it goes really hand in hand and it will probably inform what we just heard. So I really start with a brief overview and give you a background first, then outline what the DMA really is about, um, and then also really kind of draw some analytical conclusions on the design of the DMA, how it is in comparison to traditional computational methodology, before then jumping on the shortcomings and some implementation recommendations. The third part heavily builds on some work that we did at the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition, where we were um, just recently drafting a um, position statement on the implementation of the DMA, because it's still quite a novel regulatory instrument and there are still certain uncertainties, um, particularly with regard then to the application of it. Um, I will then look also a bit on the role of Turkey, have some comparative parts in it, where um, I think also Jem just um, forwarded me some regulatory approaches that exist in Turkey. And I will also look a bit on the international dimension and the role of the DMA within Turkey. I conclude with some discussions um, and some Q&A. So let's start. Um, I think it's really essential to really understand what the DMA is about, to if, and, and, and we can only do that um, by outlining a bit of the background. Uh, it all started with uh, some ideas and some concerns that competition laws in crisis and that we need uh, actually uh, some novel regulatory approaches um, in that context, because uh, there's power concentration and current and pot potential tipping of digital markets occurring. That was pretty much related to some shortcomings of competition law, at least it was claimed to be so that long lasting competition law enforcement procedures were pretty much existent. We had a strong focus on consumer welfare and the effects based approach. It is also noteworthy that the commission has just recently issued a policy brief where it is particularly looking at the role of the effects based approach after Intel and where it's also assessing to what extent it can reshape competition law in that case. Um, also, the plurality of EU competition law goals that exist in theory, because we not only look at consumer welfare standards in general, but also have a plethora of other uh, goals that exist, um, was not being used in practice. So uh, back in the days, we also saw that there was a, the academia had a really strong role and national competition authorities were then shaping digital regulatory policies enormously. We saw that the in the federal cartel office in Germany Facebook case, uh, that was quite novel, where the combination of data was actually prevented and that was considered something under exploitative abuse constellations that in the end uh, yeah, is now in front of the court, but that is quite novel from, from this regulatory perspective. Then there was this intensive legislative procedure and uh, with regard to DMA, we saw a lot of different variations and I think it's quite important to understand that the quantitative measures that exist with regards to the designation of gatekeepers are relatively high. So we only talk about a couple of US firms that probably fall under it as of now. So this was uh, particularly under Thierry Breton, something that I think he thought could be interesting from a more trade policy perspective and a protectionist perspective that, yeah, we should probably support European companies and attack US companies in that context. So we had a political momentum and that was something that eventually led to the regulation of EU 2022 of 1925 on contestable and fair markets in the digital sector, the so-called Digital Markets Act. 
Um, it is a novel regulatory um, um, approach. It is quite unique and it also received a lot of attention globally. And I think it is really, I can't continue with the slides. I'm sorry, I know it works. And it's really noteworthy um, and worthwhile to have a more interesting, uh, more uh, thorough look on it. So looking at the content, the DMA sets out rules that defining and prohibiting perceived unfair business practices by large online platforms designated as important gatekeepers between European businesses and consumers. And it defines and provides easier entry of other firms in horizontal and vertical constellations. So it's relatively broad. It is targeted at very large online platforms and no differentiation between the different sides of the platform. And this is, for instance, differently dealt with in Turkey, where we are looking at the different sizes of the platforms. Here, we only have this tool that looks at the very large online platforms. It was heavily discussed what role or what kind of regulation that is. Um, what is the theory of harm behind it? Um, is it a competition tool without concrete market relation? Because we're not looking at concrete markets anymore. We're not looking at market dominance. We're going beyond. Um, platforms are somehow considered as infrastructures in these cases. We're not following traditional competition policy logic where we assess the dominant of a firm first. And that has that, that actually led to a lot of critiques, whether this will be a tool that actually has some, some impact or whether we are now throwing competition ideas overboard and will in the end uh, end up with some form of yeah, regulation that goes that is actually not necessarily promoting the ideas, also with regard to fairness, uh, with regard to innovation, with regard to everything that is implemented in the in the DMA for the attainment of its goals. So a lot of um, economic debate also went through it. And in the end, it was condensed to something that um, can be somehow prescribed as that a couple of undertakings that are too big, they are too data rich and entrenched to be exposed to any competitive constraints by other irrelevant, um, irrelevant of a market presence of the firm. And they provide incentives for disruptive creations and entry of other firms. Whether this is true or not is still something that is quite heavily discussed. And I think that is also interestingly um, nicely reflected into the goal and the scope that is still not very clear because we are now looking at contestable and fair digital markets. Um, whether this only relates to core platform services, so whether the specific markets should actually, with regard to core platform services are at the center of attention or it's the digital markets in general is still something that needs much more attention. Contestability is not necessarily clearly defined. In recital 32, it's just the lowering of entry barriers, but it's a multi-layered concept and as it really reflects a lot of already existing yeah, um, theoretical concept within industrial organization, for instance, the same applies to fairness. Recital 33 outlines that it relates to imbalances of obligations and right of business users where the gatekeeper attains advantages. Still not clear what about the competitors here in that context and how can it really delineate it from other areas of law. And that is in the very end something that causes a lot of trouble if we are looking at than the interplay with other legal regimes that look at similar or same goals than the DMA. And by unfortunately not doing that in a proper way, I think we will have a lot of controversies um, and a lot of referral procedures to the courts and this idea of having faster and better and quicker um, enforcement options by per se rules is pretty much not working in the end because we already have some, too much legal unclarity. It also has to be really assessed, um, or the DMA has to be looked at in much, a much broader um, regulatory environment because it's a complementary tool in EU digital regulation. We have a plethora of current legislations in place. We have the DSA, we have the Platform to Business Regulation, the Data Act is currently being designed, the AI Act is currently being designed, and it really has to find its lays within this entire legal sphere. And so we need a really holistic viewpoint to in order to actually understand how it interacts with these or other existing regimes. And the variant, it still is a sector specific law that will apply in parallel with EU and national competition law rules. So this is also important to know that um, there has been a discussion what, what role for competition law still should, should play 
And in the end, we actually have this uh, parallel application of the both legal systems in place. So uh, now looking a bit on the regulatory design of the DNA, we start with a mandatory formal designation process. So it's the designation as a gatekeeper that is the prerequisite for the application of the DMA. Um, so this is really important. It started on the 2nd of May. Now they have a period um, of a couple of weeks and then until um, the beginning of July to inform them that that is exactly what is in, um, important, that we need this formal designation process that is led by the European Competition. We see that we have per se rules. So we have certain prohibitions and obligations under Article 5 to 7. We have Article 14 DMA. Article 14 DMA deals with certain um, obligations in merger control proceedings, where whatever a gatekeeper will do has to be notified to the commission, even though it does not meet the thresholds of the merger, merger regulation normally. So this is another thing. And what is super important, we also don't have efficiencies anymore that can be claimed um, by the gatekeepers in that context. So it's a really different way of, of regulating. Um, we have centralized public enforcement that has also been dealt with differently, for example, in Regulation 1 out of 2003 in Europe, where also national competition authorities had a pivotal role to play by enforcing European competition law. This is now different. Fines still remain somehow the same, um, but unfortunately, we have still really, really, really a state where it's unclear what role private enforcement should play. Um, we learned that uh, private enforcement plays a really important role in the enforcement of competition law. And I wonder why we don't have clear rules in the DMA that outline that better and outline how private enforcement can be achieved. We don't know whether also the damages directive will be analogically applicable in that context. We don't know how information can be shared between the different parties. We don't know how uh, standalone and um, cases actually work. Ultimately, that is um, the next step where we have, uh, we also have behavioral and structural remedies in case of non-compliance with the prohib prohibitions and obligations that are outlined. That is the ultimate ratio. Throughout the entire legislative process, that was also discussed um, uh, quite heavily influenced by the close to bar bill in the US or where coming from AT&T and the actually breakup of, of AT&T in the US. This was an idea that was also been discussed quite heavily in the European Parliament, whether the DMA is really enough or whether one needs structural remedies in that context as well. Now it is there, but it's an ultimate ratio. And lastly, we have a rapid updating procedure with the delegated regulation option for the, for the European competition which means that um, if there are dynamic developments and we have certain new ways of conduct that might be um, detrimental for uh, businesses or consumers, there is still the opportunity for the European Commission to start a market inquiry and then come up with new um, obligations. And that is something also that is interesting because with, with crossing regulatory powers that only is centered at the European com 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 Commission, it, it remains a black box and we don't know necessarily know in which direction the DMA will also develop. It's still dynamic, um, but this is definitely different from our traditional competition law methodology and a quite unique and interesting approach that the European legislator has chosen here. So starting with a designation process, I'll just go relatively quickly through it. Um, we have a rebuttable presumption, uh, three criteria must be met, um, a gatekeeper is um, be considered gatekeeper if it provides a core platform service that serves as an important gateway for business users to reach end users, if it has significant impact on the internal market, and it enjoys an established or expected or entrenched durable position. Core platform services was also quite heavily debated. Now it's really online, more related to, to digital services in general. Digital financial services, for instance, do not fall under it. We have cloud computing services that was quite heavily discussed whether and how it can fall under it. But this is now just an overview of what falls under that term. 
significant impact on the internal market um, is there. And once there is an annual turnover of at least 7.5 billion, um, yeah, an average market valuation of at least 75 in the past financial year, and it provides the same core platform service in at least three member states. So it's quite high. And expected entrenched and durable position exists once there is an average minimum of 45 million monthly end users established or located in the EU, at least 10,000 yearly business users established in the EU in each of the previous three financial years. Um, that was also going like up and down in the end, that is the, the agreement that they reached. I think it is quite high in the end, um, and that in, in the end was also why we got the, really why it went through through council and in the end got it because it's only looking at uh, a handful of, of undertakings. Um, it's essential that there is a self assessment of the companies and an information duty within two months. So this is already like starting and uh, the MA requires our companies already to comply with a set of obligations and prohibitions within those six months of their designation as gatekeepers. Um, now, just briefly, this is a lot on prohibitions and obligations, um, which is just showing the complexity of it. Um, a lot is influenced by existing competition cases that we had in Europe. Um, I think also the interoperability cases where I heard Microsoft before, something where we had interoperability information and the sharing there, that is also reflected. But it's just interesting as it now applies to all the gatekeepers. And whereas we had that to like specific cases beforehand, now it is just applicable to all of them. And I really wonder whether this reflects also realities and this will not necessarily prevent innovation in the context of yeah, let's say a couple of undertakings where market structures are different. So having this kind of horizontal approach that is not really looking at the case, I'm not sure whether it will be the best way, but that has just been said. There's a lot out there. Um, I don't want to go into detail, I think, but um, yeah, there are data related issues, something that hasn't been dealt with on our European competition law so far. This is also quite novel that we now have it. We have clear prohibitions with regard to data sharing, with regard to how data can be used and combined. Um, so quite extensive um, prohibitions and obligations with regard to that. Um, and unfortunately, I think that is another thing. We had the idea of the commission to, uh, of the European legislator to provide clear black letter law per se provisions that can be quite easily complied with by the companies. I attended a workshop last Friday at the commission um, where we had all the big techs and, at the table and they already saw that or pretty much told us that unfortunately they don't know how they can comply with all of them. There's still a lot of legal uncertainty, the devil lies in the details. And that just shows how tricky it is and how much compliance cost it will actually also endure. So, um, yeah, and eventually the add on is that we still have this potential of, yeah, coming up with new obligations and prohibitions and uh, additional supply, supplementary compliance obligations that exist in the end that is enormous and in the end, uh, yeah, a real burden for a lot of our companies to comply with. And that, um, yeah. It's just to show that we have a lot that needs to be looked at in that context. Enforcement and sanctions, um, the European Commission did, uh, is clearly outlined that they should be the sole enforcer of the DMA. That was, that was influenced by the issues that we saw with the GDPR predominantly, because there was a lot of legal fragmentation. We had a lot of different interpretations from a lot of member states with regards to the to data and how it is interpreted. And that was something where at some point they said, okay, in order to really reduce this potential legal fragmentation, we will be the only ones deciding and implementing them and also interpreting if it is needed in certain contexts in order just to have legal clarity in that context. Um, yes, penalties and fines are pretty much then uh, remain the same, it's fine. And here, the Ultima ratio, that is also what has been discussed quite heavily. We have now behavioral and structural remedies in case of systemic infringements of the rules. So there we need at least three violations in eight years. 
and uh, that is including a ban on acquisitions relevant to the infringement actually so that is also quite a quite a heavy tool um, regarding collective actions from individuals that is novel um, they wanted to uh, make the role of consumers more, more prominent. We have collective rights of consumers in that context where consumer associations can claim the big tech, can claim their rights um, in front of the courts. But that is also relates to all the obligations is still heavily debated. Um, currently, the academic debate rather goes in line with saying, yes, the private enforcement is possible. Um, and that is something yet what definitely needs much more um, attention. And as outlined before, the, EU, um, the DMA will apply in parallel with EU and national competition law rules, but there is still the risk of overly broad blocking effects on national laws that may follow the same or similar goals. And that is one of the points that I will outline later on. So um, just quite briefly, um, it here now the we also saw the the next steps that will follow um it entered uh, into force in november it started to apply on the 2nd of may um the notification deadline for companies that meet the gatekeeper quantitative thresholds will be july 2023 then they must self assess and notify without delay and in any case within the, the, those two months or so from the point at which the criteria are satisfied, whether they fall under the quantitative thresholds. Then we have the designation decision in September 2023, um, which is quite fast, but there is the option to actually um, go in front of court as well. So we will see whether, yeah, um, at least I heard a couple of companies in that context that said, okay, let's see, but we might actually tackle that potentially. Um, so um, looking at yeah, the obligations that then will start to apply will only be in March 2024. Until then, a lot of time will still be there. And currently, the Commission is really trying to have these stakeholder workshops in order to already see where potential issues are in order, the, and in order then to potentially also define certain guidelines that is also foreseen in the DMA. So that is kind of the next steps that are there. We will see how this will develop um, and how clear the rules in the end will be. So the conclusion that I, uh, that I draw is, um, there is really a change of paradigm in the tradition of economic regulation and the role of competition policy. This firstly relates to the fact that we don't look at market ordering anymore. We just have a market design approach, which I don't necessarily think is something that yeah is quite clear and but will help and will be beneficial in the end um i see that there are a lot of shortcomings with regard to competition law that that might not necessarily work but whether the market design and whether the competition is not uh, whether the legislator now really draw the right assumptions in certain circumstances i'm not sure but we see that we're looking going from restoring competition towards the creation of competition in the long run um we have exactly some obligations that reflect existing EU and national competition law cases, but this time we are just, and this is also what I mentioned before, applying them um, without the requirement of market uh, dominance anymore. We are not looking at the real effects on the market. Um, and a lot of people, and I think I'm also inclined to say that the DMA is rather a novel form of infrastructure regulation. And we really need to see how this will then be developed and what role competition and then context should play if we interpret the norms and provisions in a certain way. In the end, I think uh, it is quite heavily influenced by protectionist tendencies. Um, this is something we need to keep in mind in that context. Um, I'm not sure whether we will have that in other contexts and whether we will find political agreement in whether competition law should also lead into this direction. I think it's quite unique and very relatively restricted to the couple of US firms that are now on the radar of the regulator. But what we have to assess is that really there is the surrender of the more economic approach in that context. We have the per se obligations instead of case specific um, approaches. The effects based approach doesn't exist anymore. So uh, this time we are now favoring type one errors, which is interesting. Um, and we also have this different cost benefit analysis. Um, I'm, I mean, 
currently it's been discussed quite heavily whether competition law should also go more into this direction. We had that in this policy brief in March where the commission is pretty much saying that maybe there are certain issues with regard to the effects-based approach, but I'm still thinking <laughs> that we should at least look at what the effects-based approach is really all about. Um, and we should, should just be clear on certain, let's say, the as efficient competitor, uh, competitor test, like what is needed from an evidence point of view. We should just be clear on that factors. But in the end, not having it, I'm not sure whether this will just be detrimental and um, I'm not sure whether favoring type one errors will be the best way forward. We ha don't have no, we ha are not having efficiencies in that context. And yes, in the end, fairness and contestability are multi-layered concepts that remain a conundrum. So in which direction are we heading? What is contestability? Is it just lowering end of entry barriers? What is fairness? Um, it's interesting. We have a lot of like already existing literature on it. It's coined in industrial organization, the term contestability and the formal that pretty much said, okay, that uh, higher market concentration might be justified by potential entry of firms. But this is differently coined in that context here. So we can't necessarily make use of that notion. And I really wonder what they mean in the very end and how will, particularly under the issue with the quasi-regulatory issues that we have, how this will further develop. So second point is that we see a clear tendency from decentralizations towards centralization. We had a long debate um, in the competition area where whether national competition authorities should really enforce European competition laws. We saw that that was enormously helpful, but this has now been not relevant anymore. I think it is heavily influenced by the GDPR. Um, unfortunately, we still see that there's limited remaining legislative competences from member states, in particular, including the business to business level. And that was an area that was typically like dealt with within member states and not within the European level. But by outlining that no other laws that follow the same goals that the DMA are applicable anymore, you just reduce the potential of making your own laws that obviously go in certain directions and similar directions. You just really cut off the options for member states in that regard. And we also have to centralize for quasi regulatory competences for the European Commission because we have the delegated lawmaking options and in which direction this will lead is also a bit of a, of a crystal ball and a black box. Um, and enforcement competences, um, decentralized enforcement mechanisms remain, but they are very limited. Um, European competition law still plays a, lo a role, that's true, but again, the European Commission then will play a, a much more important role in that context. And we have Article 1.7 that is also somehow um, trying to establish coherency of decisions. And that pretty much says that whenever a national competition or another authority is ordering specific remedies that might conflict with the DMA. The DMA obligations are the ones that should prevail. So any national um, regulatory authority cannot come up with any remedy that goes counter a prohibition or obligation under the DMA. So this is also something that backs a bit of the idea that now the European Commission is deciding on everything. Nonetheless, European and national competition law remains applicable and should have this umbrella function. Um, so that's also there. Um, looking at shortcomings and implementation recommendations, it goes pretty much in the line that um, unfortunately we have this intersection of the different national laws and the DMA. And if they overlap under the primacy of EU law principle, the DMA prevails. And that leaves very little room for maneuver of for national lawmakers. And in the end, I think uh, that is why we say, and, and I strongly um, think that is a supported idea that we really need to interpret that um, option relatively narrow and give national lawmakers as much possible and room for, for legislation in that context, because uh, otherwise, uh, the gatekeepers will be privileged because they won't fall under national rules, whereas the other ones will be. And I think this is something that we definitely need to 
prevent. Um, same thing goes hand in hand with uh, national uh, competition laws, because that is something that uh, where the DMA tells us that national competition laws are still applicable. And that is the exception to the rule of other national laws. But the question again is what is a national competition law? Um, and Germany is quite unique in that context because we have the 10th Amendment back in the days where we have a special tool that is really just designed for the gatekeepers. And that is something that um, should in this context actually be applicable and remain applicable. But here's also again, legal uncertainty. And I think here we just need to be quite clear on the fact that they, those laws should be applicable, even though they follow different, again, uh, rationales and might not necessarily easily be subsumed under competition laws. And then regarding the institutional design, I just really go quickly through it. Uh, we need complementary enforcement of the DMA and the competition rules. Um, the commission decisions under the DMA should not unduly restrict decisions of national competition authorities. Um, we need early coordination and close cooperation between the commission and national authorities, because this is clearly also what is currently being foreseen with this high panel group. Um, so here, a lot of different um, actors from the varying um, uh, regulatory authorities come together and they decide how the law is interacting with other legal regimes. And so that is enormously important to let give the firms also a bit of a better understanding which laws they need to comply with. And if there is, for instance, a conflict of the different laws and obligations, how they can actually overcome those issues. And that is enormously important. And we also need exactly the coordination in that context. So this is here exactly the high level group for the commission. It needs to be actively supported. We have a lot of collaboration with member states that is needed and private enforcement needs to be really on the radar. And the role of the national and new legislator is crucial to enabling national courts to enforce standalone and follow on DMA cases. So pretty much again, outlining the possibility of DMA enforcement within national courts. That has been done in Germany. Um, uh, France is now following suit, but exactly this is really what is needed. So for further explanation, um, this is really a paper that, that I wrote together with some, some colleagues of mine and the MPI position paper is quite extensively looking into that and is really giving you a lot of more context if you're more interested into it. Thanks a lot. And uh, now just a quick international dimension. Uh, I just really skipped that. Um, I think Interesting is that typically Turkish competition law was applicable under Article 6.3 of Rome 2 regulation in, in, in Europe. Um, question is, is for instance now the e-commerce law 6.5.6.3 in the EU also applicable or not? This is not necessarily uh, regulated because it might not fall under Article 6.3, so we need much more, really much more um, yeah, clarity in that context. Um, what is the real impact of the DMA in Turkey? This is, I think, what we might can or we can discuss right now. And in the end, are we, and I think with the e-commerce law 6563 that is following a different approach, um, we're not necessarily going into the convergence of global digital laws in that context. We have different regulatory approaches. And that the question again is, we saw that with the GDPR, the GDPR became somehow a standard also in other countries where we had a Brussels effect. I'm wondering whether the same will happen with the DMA. Some people foresee it like that. I'm still not sure, um, but that clearly is something what, what is now being discussed and whether we, of course, future will, will tell us in which direction we will go. Yes, but we have different regulatory approaches in Turkey and to you. That is something that, that I think I can conclude with. And thank you a lot for your attention. And yeah, again, bringing back the question of is the Digital Markets Act a viable solution for attaining contestable and fair digital markets? We will see. Um, I think it really depends on the implementation. I think it really depends on what contestable and fair really is. 
So we need clarity. Um, and I think future will tell us in which direction we are heading, but it's clearly novel and a quite unique approach that we have also from a global point of view. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, Europe, for this wonderful presentation and concise, very concise and informative uh, presentation. Um, well, yes, that's for sure. Turkish Turkish approach is very different, but uh, I didn't mention and we didn't talk to you before this presentation. We had another draft law, which was in the uh, Competition Act, and that was parallel to DMA. So it didn't get through to the legislation. It was just uh, just a draft, uh, but if it was going to be uh, enacted by the lawmaker, it, we had something similar to the MA and the German law. It was a hybrid law. Some provisions were basically modeled from the German law, Some, most of them from the MA. So then we could have said, yeah, we, we are very parallel, but now we only have this e-commerce law and uh, <laughs> it's very unique, <laughs> as I just uh, yeah. explained. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, maybe we have questions for your presentation. Uh, I'm now turning to the audience. Uh, if there is Erman, I, I see that you raise your hand and I'll take it. Okay, so let, let's start with Erman. Okay, I will ask first. And first of all, thank you so much. It was very comprehensive, the discussion. Thank you for the, uh, the bringing it here. And uh, my question, maybe it could have been a topic for a different uh, the presentation, but I just want to learn because we couldn't see the German people here too much. And for that reason, I will also be happy to learn something from you about the German act. And I know that you also, the, the Bundeskultermund amend the, the, the reg regulation and uh, based on the amendments of the 19A, uh, I know uh, it explicitly includes an exhaustive list of the prohibited conducts by the undertakings of uh, the, the paramount significance for competition and the list of behaviors under this section um, is similar but not identical to Article 5, 6, and 7 of the, the DMA. So in particular, your section is shorter and less detailed, so we can say that it's, its approach is a bit ex post rather than ex ante, which we've seen in the, the DMA. So this is a digital market we are talking about, and for that reason, maybe the different approach can be better. And for that reason, the DMAs maybe bring something new to the market, to do discussions. And for that reason, I want to learn what is your perspective, which way would be better for the contestability and the fairness in the market, being ex post or ex ante, or you just see this as a the policy choice and there is no too much difference between them. I just want to hear from you something about the comparison of the German Act. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think looking at the German Act, um, I would also say that we rather look at an ex-ante perspective. Um, so I'm not really following the idea of um, it's really an ex-post assessment that we are doing because it really is forward-looking. And the idea behind that was also that if you're under 19A, um, there are also other options. So this is just not an exhaustive list of obligations that you need to comply with. There might also be other obligations that they may come up with. I agree that obviously there's much more room for maneuver and there is at least the potential of looking into other, um, let's say, ex post perspectives in that regard. But um, first, I think it is also not clearly an ex post tool that we have in Germany. now looking at the question, what is the preferred way of attaining contestable and fair markets? Um, we saw that the ex-post control was pretty much not necessarily lead, leading to the expected outcome that a lot of people were wishing for. I mean, we can start a debate, what is the right regulatory approach? Um, and that goes pretty much back to then the discussion, what role should the more economic approach have? follow, do we follow the Chicago school or like the behavioral, uh, the, the more new foundations in that context, I think we can open up that Pandora box as well. But I think what is, um, and I think you also mentioned that, what is quite peculiar in that context is that this idea of um, the typical Easter Brookshire error cost framework with regard to type one and type two errors somehow is 
has to, or like, let's say, it has to be maybe looked at differently in markets where digital gatekeepers are present because there are certain peculiarities, the economies of scope, data uh, specific economies of scale and scope, um, and a lot of other factors where we have entrenchment, we have like a different way of conglomerate issues that are really different from cases that we saw in the past. And I think that is probably a thing where um, at least going with Krima, Schweizer, Montoya, this is also what you showed before, there might be actually some room for a much more interventionist stance in that regard. Um, I wonder, however, whether the DMA's way is not in the very end cutting off much more flexibility that is needed. And this is what I fear. Um, and I would rather say we had, or my ideal wish were, was pretty much to combine a bit more this flexibility that we have with an ex post assessment and combine that with this ex ante perspective and the rules that are now outlined within the DMA. So that would have been ideal. Um, I also think we should have had an option at least to look at real market concerns and not come up with this general idea of, oh, once there is a gatekeeper, no matter in which market he will be present, is present, he has to uh, comply with the, the specific rules. I think that might be a bit too broad, um, but in the end, we, we, will, we will see. Um, I hope this, this clarifies a bit what you were looking for. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question and the answer. Uh, let's proceed with Artikin. Artikin, please, we're waiting for your question and comment. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Hoffman, thank you for this valuable presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, first of all, you said that the legal basis of uh, the DMA is, is the aim of internal market, right? So the commission seems to achieve a full harmonization. And as we see that it now follows the ordinary legislative procedure uh, in the form of a regulation, right? Uh, but you also mentioned that some member states may apply for obligations or investigations regarding digital markets. And we see Germany uh, as a quite good example. Uh, Germany is a little bit more aggressive than in the EU in general. Uh, and also in the recommendation part, you said that uh, it should not, DMA should not restrict the decisions of national competition authorities. And we have a quite good example here, uh, the uh, investigation of Bundeskartellamt against Meta, against Facebook. And uh, basically uh, they ruled that a privacy violation can be regarded as a competition infringement, right? So. Uh, first question is, what do you think? Are, are, are we going to see uh, such investigations in the per, further or uh, is it not going to happen? So, uh, because I, I, I believe that it's a uh, quite important step what Bundeskartan did back in this investigation. And we need to see uh, such uh, tools and applications of competition law to digital markets. And my second question is about thresholds uh, of the DMA. So we see some quantitative uh, criteria uh, in the form of, uh, as you said, pre reputable presumptions, right? But what about qualitative uh, criteria, right? Because uh, almost every time when we talk about, when we discuss about the DMA, we say that uh, meta uh, may not be regarded uh, as a gatekeeper in the future due to this quantitative criteria, due to these thresholds, right? And I would uh, like to ask about what about qualitative criteria? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. Thanks a lot. Regarding the first question and the role of national competition authorities, I couldn't agree more, first of all, that the Federal Cardinal Office was really the source of inspiration for the DMA. So that is clearly something where you really have the point. Um, with regard to the Facebook proceedings now, Meta, um, I think the case has now not been differently dealt with, um, even if the DMA exists. Um, we have obligations that are clearly now outlining that case. 
So it is reflected in a certain obligation for now the gatekeepers that are designated not to combine the specific data and to come up with specific choice options if they do differently. So this is something that in the very end is nicely addressed in the, in the DMA. And I think there we won't necessarily have the issue that we are currently having with competition laws um, because it is rather clear in the DMA because we don't have to necessarily look at the potential theory of harm and then exactly the issue that will come up with that idea of what theory of harm is behind that combination of data and using the option of consumers to choose whether data will be combined or not. Um, and that was something that went through the different instances where in the end, the highest regional court in Dusseldorf pretty much said, um, yeah, but maybe we can also look at exclusionary conduct um, and not to exploitative conduct. Because if you look at exploitative abuse constellations, and that is one of the most interesting points in that context, the question is whether the counterfactual scenario, so, the case where competition was in place would have led to not exactly the same outcome because the consumers is not caring about it. They don't care whether the data will be combined or not. They just enter the term, say yes to the terms and uh, agreements and uh, actually comp um, give their agreement and consent. And I think that is exactly where now with the DMA, we will have less issues because that is now one of the most pertinent questions that is also referred to the European Court of Justice. So I agree from the perspective of let's have a pivotal role of national competition authorities to give them leeway and to give them opportunities to look in certain conducts, because this has happened in the past. But with regard to this data related issue, this is now better been dealt with under the DMA, because under competition law, I really have bit of my troubles to see a theory of harm under exploitative constellation. Maybe exclusionary conduct might be different. So Facebook knows so much about it and has then this reinforcing effects that in the very end lead then to a potential advantage where others, potential and potential competitors might not enter anymore or might be excluded at some point. I think that could be a better way of justifying it, but under exploitative con abuse constellations, I'm not so sure. So I rather like the way that the DMA is looking at it because we still have then at least legal clarity. But in the end, in the data case, the European Court of Justice will have to decide. And is the case is now pending at the European Court of Justice. Well, thank you very much for the uh, question and the answer. Now we have, I think, one more question. Armand? Uh, yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Jörg. It was really uh, good to hear. We have the opportunity to exchange hats and talk about these issues uh, from a European perspective. I would like to open a window into what you said about type 1 and type 2 errors. And uh, the way you described it is that DMA is gravitating towards favoring maybe uh, for lack of a better word, uh, type 1 errors or type 2 errors, but this approach, of course, comes with its own set of risks. So perhaps maybe we would benefit all from hearing more uh, about what you think uh, the risks of having a type 1, uh, favoring type 1 or type 2, or what else could the enforcers done to prevent this, or uh, would there be an alternative? approach maybe uh, to not do that. And if we have time, uh, maybe I can ask uh, one more question, and that is about private enforcement. In Turkey, I think it will be fair to say that the private enforcement aspect of competition is yet to be developed. We have only so many cases uh, finalized uh, that provides us guidance. And you also said that in this realm, uh, in the realm of DMA, uh, there is uh, the, the functionality of private enforcement maybe has not been fully incorporated. And I think this would be even a bigger challenge in Turkey because we already have a lot uh, more to do uh, in the general context, not for uh, the digital markets alone. So uh, I'd also like to hear your thoughts about how to improve this or how to better incorporate uh, maybe the private enforcement aspect into the DMA. Of course. Um, so first, regarding the type one, type two um, question, um, what I mean is that 
I personally am not sure whether the approach that they are currently taking of saying, okay, what we usually thought in those contexts was that, oh, we rather don't do anything because at least we have the markets that might potentially come up with the, the, the solution that we want. And we don't want to cut off that option. That is typically the assumption that we had. Then at some point they said, ah, okay, we don't have these disruptive kind of creative constructions like uh, uh, innovation cycles where there were certain new markets that were created. We didn't have these disruptions anymore. Um, and that was a different dynamic where at some point they said, okay, markets are not delivering anymore. And whereas in the, in the past, we saw that companies went big and they actually then at some point really had to ex exit the market again. This has changed. And I think that was a reason where, I mean, you could argue with Schumpeter in that context and everything, but I don't want to open up that, that box. But what you can assess in that context is that they come up with the idea of now, uh, we don't really care about what the markets really can provide us in certain circumstances. And I think that is something that I would have dealt with differently and I want to, would have wanted the commission to give at least some flexibility to assess, okay, if we now have an entirely different market constellation, let's say it's not a, or even it's not an oligopolistic market structure, or we, we, we have a different form where Microsoft is just entering a, a certain market. And does, is, is it really justified that even though there is an entirely different markets constellation, Microsoft is still the one firm that falls under it. That was something where I thought, let's have maybe a form of, yeah, specific, let's say layer where we at least look at the market or where they can come up with efficiencies. That is also a way forward where we could at least have looked at this context and at least assess, hey, look at the different efficiency defenses that you might have come up with. But not doing this is something that I'm, really a bit skeptical about. So probably just having that in mind, coming up with an efficiency defense might be interesting and at least, yeah, have that as a false back option would be good, would have been good regarding private enforcement. So the second question, I mean, what we need is um, just much more clarity on actually whether the single provisions and obligations can be privately enforced by the people, uh, by, by, by the, the right holders in that context. Um, there is still a bit of a debate, um, at least in Germany, it's quite clear and a lot of people favor the idea of um, enforcing it on, via unfair competition laws. So that is something that gives us at least some leeway, but only the let, that, that issue that we have with regard to the lack of clarity this is something that we definitely need to overcome. And we need clarity for all the private actors that they can enforce their rights in front of courts. And we need, and it's again something, we need judges that in the very end understand the provisions. We need a much better <laughs> training of that in order to really come of, of the judges and of the lawyers and everything in order to really provide with the ideal solution and enforcement mechanism. And I think uh, this is a huge endeavor. It's a huge um, yeah, wish that I have in that context, but I think it's necessary that we just really look on that and uh, really try to get much more know-how on, on, in the heads of, of judges and of the ones that are deciding in those cases. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you uh, for the uh, question and the answers. Uh, just following this question and this Schumpeterian view, whether or not markets can, can correct the uh, failures uh, in digital, um, uh, digital digital industries, there's a comment uh, I just read, uh, which is really related to what you have just said. Uh, if Bing succeeds on its mission to take down the Goliath, the Google, should we re revisit our initial judgment that digital markets are not self-competitive in nature and prone to tipping, thus require external ex ante regulatory intervention like DMA? Just, just the discussion that you have made, and it's like that's a very good point. And we we yeah. are also observing in Turkey that in some markets, like uh, for example, food delivery, uh, we had a 
very durable mon monopoly for like nine, 10 years, maybe more. And now the market has changed by uh, platform competition. So maybe it's not tipping that, 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 that uh, powerful. Uh, so I don't know, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a good point that he made. Uh, all right. Uh, any other questions? It's now. I, I have a, a, a yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. First of all, thank you so much, um, Mr. Hoffman, for your excellent pro, um, presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask that: should the uh, gate gatekeepers follow the the all obligations or uh, prohibitions that you mentioned, or the commission will specify some of them? Um, I, I I asked it. I asked, asked this question because. In possible Turkish uh, competition law amendment, uh, the, uh, the Turkish competition board will specify some of them, and the the undertaking should not follow all of that obligations. Um, actually, it is different. Um, the DMA is just outlining per se obligations, and the commission is not deciding on the, whether they will take up specific cases in that context or not. It's really a thing where they need to comply with all of the obligations, prohibitions. So all obligations apply ex officio, yes. no uh, exemption or anything. In Turkish law is different. Turkish law, after following designation decision, the, 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 the authority decides which obligations will apply to this, to, to that particular uh, gatekeeper. So it's it's different in that regard. But that, that uh, law didn't go through the legislative process, so uh, it's just a draft. Okay, uh, well, thank you, uh, Jörg. Uh, we held you for a long time. It's now over an hour. Uh, and it was a wonderful uh, presentation and we had a fruitful uh, discussion session. So thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, uh, coming here and listening to us and, and contributing to this, this uh, seminar. Uh, and uh, hope to see you next week. Thank you, Jörg. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jem. And regarding the quantitative, qualitative question. Yeah. He, oh, just, I missed that. Just, no, you just write me an email. I will answer. It's no worries. <laughs> I just realized that I forgot to answer one of the questions. But all right. Thanks so much, Jem. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Thanks. Arkadaşlar iyi akşamlar herkese teşekkür ederiz katıldığınız için. Haftaya görüşmek üzere.